Good morning. My name is uh, Randy. I'm one of the associate ministers here at Eagle Christian Church. And before I get started in, into the book of Philippians, I just want to say what, a, what an honor and what a privilege it is for me to, to be here with you this morning, to, to worship with you, to, to, to hear us as a body of, of Christ proclaim together how great thou art, how great is our mighty God. And, and now as we, as we turn our attention to, to his word, it's, it's really my, my prayer and, and really my desire that this would be a time where, where we come face to face with God through his word. And because of this amazing encounter that we have this morning, that we would leave this place changed. That we'd be a little bit different when we leave than when we first arrived. Because we have encountered an amazing God. And I'm convinced that when we come face to face with, with an amazing God in worship and, and through study of his word, we can't leave and be the same. It challenges us to change. It challenges us to, to be different than, than when we first arrived. And, and this morning, before, before we get into our, our text out of Philippians chapter 2, I, I just want to share with you a story from the Wall Street Journal. It's a story written by a gentleman by the name of Varick Greetens. He's a former Navy SEAL. And in this article, he, he divulges the one quality that matters the most in the making of a successful Navy SEAL. And I want you to just listen to, to an excerpt from, from his article. He says that the rigors that SEALs go through begin on the day that they walk into basic underwater demolition training in Coronado, California. The class is universally recognized as one of the hardest military training courses in the world. The training lasts a grueling six months. And the classes include large contingents of, of high school and college track and, and football stars, national champion swimmers, and, and top-ranked ra- wrestlers and, and boxers from all over the country. But only 10 to 20% of the men who begin this, this grueling training usually manage to finish. And so Eric asks in, in this article, what kind of man makes it through this kind of training? And he goes on and he writes, that's hard to say. But I do know generally who won't make it. There are a dozen types that fail. The the weightlifting meatheads who who think that the size of their biceps is an indication of their strength. The perining leaders who who don't want to get dirty or or deal with the mess. And the look at me former athletes who have always been told that they are stars. In short, those who fail are the ones who focus on themselves and have a self-centered attitude. Some men who seemed impossibly weak at the beginning of SEAL training, men who puked on runs and had trouble with pull-ups, they made it. Some men who were skinny and short and whose teeth shattered just looking at the ocean also made it through. Some men who were visibly afraid, sometimes to the point of shaking, made it too. And almost all the men who survived possessed one common quality. They were men who, even in great pain, faced with the test of their lives, who had the ability to step outside of their own pain, to put aside their own fear and ask, how can I help the guy next to me? They had more than the fist of courage and physical strength. They also had a heart large enough to think about others and the discipline to dedicate themselves to a higher purpose. It's an amazing quality, a quality that makes for for great military men and women and and great leaders in our country, but I am convinced that it's also a quality that makes for a great life, regardless of where we find ourselves. This morning, as we look into the book of Philippians, Paul is going to give us three examples of, of what it looks like to live a life worthy of the gospel. He's going to show us men who lived out what it looks like to to, to have the attitude of Christ in their life. Paul is going to put flesh on the commandments that he has already given to the church in Philippi that we've studied over the last couple of months. You know, there's an old Chinese proverb that says, tell me and I will forget. Show me and, and I will remember, but let me do it and I will understand. You see, going back to the end of chapter 1, Paul has told the church how to live their life, how to have the attitude of Christ. And he said, live in a manner worthy of the gospel. 
He said, stand firm in one spirit and contend as as one man. Be like-minded and have the same love. Be one in spirit and one in purpose. He said, live lives of, of great humility and consider others better than yourselves. He said, look not only to your own, own interests, but also to the interests of, of others. In verse 5, he says, have the attitude or have the mindset of, of Christ. He said, continue to work out your salvation. Continue to put energy into this gift of salvation that, that you have been blessed with, that's come into your life. And he said, do all things, do everything without complaining, without grumbling, without murmuring, without arguing. Paul has told the church how to live. And now this morning, we we get to a passage of scripture where Paul shows the Philippians what this looks like. He he shows us here this morning what it looks like to really live the kind of life that God is calling us to live. It's life illustrated. If you have your Bibles and and want to turn with me, Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 17, Paul writes and he says, but, but even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad and I, and I rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. In verse 19, it says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I may also be cheered when I receive news about you because I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests and not those of of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope therefore to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come. Verse 25, he says, but I think it's necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you in his distress because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with with great joy, and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to to make up for the help you yourself could not give to me. This is an amazing passage of scripture. And it's a passage of scripture that that a lot of people want to just skim through or or skip over, thinking that it's just biographical and everyday matters. But I'm encouraging you this morning as we look at this passage of scripture not to treat it that way, but to look at it as a real illustration for how we should live our lives, of how we can walk out of here today with a new commitment to be God's men and to be God's women in in our world. Because this is the part, this is a passage of scripture where we get to see what a life worthy of the gospel really looks like. And Paul starts out, with his own illustration. His own illustration, and this is something that we see Paul do from time to time throughout the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, many of you know this this passage. Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, and he says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. The next chapter of Philippians, Philippians chapter 3, Paul's going to write, and he's going to say, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. And again, in Philippians chapter 4, Paul's going to say, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And and in verse 17, Paul says, look to me. Look at the illustration that that I have for, for living this kind of life. And he says, but even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith. And I have to just simply stop and ask, what's Paul talking about? What, what, what really is a, a drink offering? And what does it mean to, to be poured out like a drink offering? You see, some 2,000 years removed, that, that phrase doesn't mean a whole lot to me. It doesn't mean a whole lot in, in my life. And so I encourage you to, to turn with me back to the Old Testament, to, to the book of Exodus. And remember, the, the book of Exodus is the story of how God delivered his people 
If you remember the story, God's people are enslaved in Egypt. And, and, and they're forced to, to, to live under the rule of, of the Pharaoh. And so God raises up a man named Moses. And Moses goes back to, to Egypt and through a series of events, <clears throat> convinces the Pharaoh to let God's people go. And so Moses leads that, that, that group of people, the Hebrew people, the children of God, <clears throat> out of Egypt. They cross through the Red Sea on, on dry ground. They're out in the desert, and God provides water out of a rock. And manna from heaven, he sustains them, and he takes care of them. It's a story of, of God's deliverance of his people. But we also get a portion of the book of Exodus where Moses is communicating with, with God. And God is telling him, this is how my people are to live. This is how they are to interact with each other in society. And there's a lot of, of, of guidelines and rules and laws associated with how to treat one another. There's a lot of rules and, and specifications on, on how to build a temple, a place where, where they can go and worship God Almighty. There's a lot of rules and, and laws pertaining to how the priests are, are to dress. But there's also uh, laws and commandments and, and, and guidelines about how they are to worship. How they are to, 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 to worship their amazing God. And in Exodus chapter 29, we read a, a passage of scripture that makes a reference of a drink offering. Starting in verse 38, it says, This is what you are to offer on the altar regularly each day. Two lambs a year old. Offer one in the morning and the other at twilight. With the first lamb, offer a tenth of an ephah of the finest flour mixed with a quarter of a hen of oil from pressed olives. And a quarter of a hen of wine as a drink offering. You see, in the Old Testament, the, the, the drink offering was the, the, the offering that's poured on top of the sacrifice. It's, it's the one that's poured on top of, of the lamb. It's the, it's the wine that's, that's consumed with, with flame and a puff of smoke, an element of the offering. And so again, what, what is Paul talking about here? Even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, you see, what Paul is saying is that the important thing is their faith. And the important thing is their sacrifice. The important thing is, is their service. It shows his great humility. Instead of Paul saying, Look at me and the important things that are going on in my service and the important things that are going on in my faith. He's saying, no, I'm just an element, just a small piece. I'm, I'm the puff of smoke. But you and your sacrifice, you and your service, you and your faith, that is the offering. And I'm a very, very small piece of that. I'm, I'm the drink offering poured on top. It kind of echoes what, what he's already said in, in verse 3 of chapter 2. Do nothing out of selfish amb ambition, but in humility consider others better than yourself. You see, Paul's in prison. He's, he's chained to a Roman guard. His life may be coming to an end, but he's saying, you're important. Your faith is the sacrifice. I'm a tiny element of that. But it's you and your faith and your sacrifice and your service. So we get an illustration here of, uh, of Paul's humility. But we also get an illustration in this short passage of scripture uh, about his compassion. See, Paul is a, is, a, is a guy who's willing to do with less and really even die for the sake of Christ and for the sake of others. Remember again, Paul, Paul's under house arrest. And he makes some amazing statements here. In verse 19, he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. In verse 25, he says, but, but I think it's necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus. Those are amazing statements. Because here's Paul in great need, in a dire situation, and he's saying, it's not about me. I want to have compassion upon you, Philippians. And so I'm going to send Timothy to you to minister to you. And in the case of Epaphroditus, I care for Epaphroditus. He longs for you. He, he can't wait to see you again. And so I think it's necessary to send him back. Paul is willing to do with less. 
his compassion for, for Epaphroditus, his, his, his compassion for the, the church in Philippi it is amazing. And I wonder if any of us in that same situation would be willing to do the same thing. I wonder. We see an illustration here of Paul's humility. We also see a, an illustration here of his compassion. We also see an illustration here of his rejoicing. He says, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Again, remember Paul's situation. In, in the midst of that circumstance where he finds himself, Paul still illustrates a life filled with joy and, and, and a quiet peace. And again, we have to ask the question, why? How, how, can joy, how can Paul be filled with joy? How can he really rejoice? I think it's because of the work of God that he sees come to life in the Philippian church. Paul can rejoice because of their faith. He can rejoice because of their service and, and their sacrifice for the gospel. It's not a woe is me, look at me, poor me situation, but rather an attitude that responds to difficult life situations with absolute and pure joy. And really, that's what the book of Philippians is all about. In spite of my situation, in spite of my circumstances, I can have joy, and I can have peace. And so we see the illustration of Paul, but, but we don't stop there. We, we also get the illustration of this man named Timothy. And Paul writes about this amazing man of faith, and he says, I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. What an amazing man. And, and I have to remember or be reminded that, that, that Timothy is right here with Paul. Philippians chapter one, verse one, Paul and Timothy Servants of Christ Jesus. Timothy is probably the scribe, the one who is pinning the, the, the words that Paul speaks as he sits under house arrest, chained to that Roman guard. So it really kind of makes sense for Paul to think of Timothy and, and to use him as an illustration for the kind of life Paul has called the Philippians to live. And really, Paul points out five qualities that, that really make his point. He simply says, to begin with, I, I have no one else like him. Literally, I have no one of the same soul. I have no one of equal mind. Literally, Timothy was like-minded. And, and, and I wonder if, if Paul thought of Timothy as he wrote that command in, in verse 2, to be like-minded. As, as they struggle together and work together for the sake of the gospel. I have no one else like him. No one else who is like-minded that comes alongside me and moves with the same spirit and the same purpose. Timothy was like-minded, but he also was concerned for others. Literally, Timothy had, had genuine, authentic concern for all the things regarding the people in Philippi. All the things regarding you. Paul's writing and he says, I, he, he's looking out for your interest and he's looking out for your welfare. He's concerned about you. Not only his own interest, but he's also interested in, in you and how things are going for you. He wasn't selfish. He looked out for the interests of, of not only the Philippians, but he also looked out for the interests of Jesus Christ without any regard to, to what he may or may not get in return. You see, for Timothy, ministry and service wasn't about him. It wasn't about what he could get out of it. Ministry was about what he could invest in the lives of others. He was a giver. He, he wasn't a taker. And so Paul uses him as an illustration of how the Philippians are to live their lives. He also manifested Jesus. You see, Timothy was, was, was a walking, talking illustration of someone who lived out verse five. Your, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. See, Timothy had been with Paul for, for over 10 years. Timothy was a man who had seen the beatings that Paul endured. He had seen the arrests. He had seen the imprisonments. He had seen the, uh, the ups and downs of ministry and knew exactly what it meant to be a follower of Christ. 
And I think Timothy, as a young man, could have done anything he wanted to do, but he chose to stay. He chose to stay. And he knew full well what that meant for him to stay. The mind of Christ compelled him to surrender. The mind of Christ compelled him to to humble himself and to think about Christ and and his mission in, in the world and to serve really for the sake of the gospel. He lived the attitude of Christ. And he had also proven himself as a servant. Timothy was known by the Philippians. You see, he had he had been there as as many as four different times, going back to the very beginning of the church. He had instant credibility. And the Philippians knew his character, they knew his track record, and that he was through and through a servant. He was committed to the things of God's kingdom. And Paul is saying, when you think about the life that I've told you to live, look to Timothy. Timothy is an example. He's an illustration of the life that God wants us to live. But we also get the illustration of a man named Epaphroditus. And maybe Epaphroditus serves as the very best illustration because he was a Philippian. Epaphroditus was was one of their own. And and really, other than the book of Philippians, we we don't know much about Epaphroditus. But in the little bit that, that Paul tells us about him, we get a picture of a life lived in great surrender to Christ. Listen again. Paul writes and he says, Uh, I think it's necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus. He's my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you in his distress because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on him. In verse 28, it says, Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him to you so that when you see him again, you may be glad. In verse 29, it says, So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his very life to make up for the help that you yourselves could not give me. He's a great illustration that really lives out the principles that that Paul is telling the Philippians to to live. And just listen again to, to some of the words that he uses. My brother a term that shows deep relationship, deep love, great affection. He's a fellow worker. He he works side by side with me to put energy into the work of the gospel, to do the things that, that God has commanded and called us to do with our very lives. He's a fellow soldier. He fights and contends together with me in the spiritual battle that rages in this world to fight against the, the forces of darkness and, and the great enemy of Satan in our world. He says, he's your messenger. He's working to meet your needs as a messenger. He's working on your behalf because he's the one who is carrying the letter and and a financial gift to me on your behalf. He's my caregiver. He's the one who is ministering to me in, in, in my situation, even at his own expense. He was sick. He almost died. But Epaphroditus is an example of what it means to live the Christian life. You see, this is what the Christian life looks like. And and, and Paul says, welcome him and, and honor men like him because his actions reflect the absolute attitude of Christ in every single way. He risked his life for the things that he said he believed in. See, as we look at these illustrations... I'm I'm confronted with the reality that that this was real in the life of Paul. This faith in an amazing God and and Jesus who had died to to buy him back from sin. It was real in his life. It was real in the life of Timothy. It was real in the life of Epaphroditus. You know, Paul, an amazing servant of God, he wrote most of the New Testament. He started numerous churches. He endured great suffering. And yet we see in him humility. We, we see in him compassion. In Timothy and Epaphroditus, we see great attitudes of, of service and ministry, regardless of what it may cost them in their lives. 
And Paul says, the life that I told you to live, this is what it looks like. Timothy, Epaphroditus, my, my, myself. Paul has told them, he's shown them, and now it's really up to the church in Philippi to live it out. But even more so, it's up to the church in Eagle, Idaho to live it out. We've been told. We've been shown. Now it's time for you and for me to walk out of this place today and have the discipline and, and, and the decision to live our lives differently. You've probably heard of a lady by the name of Jerry, Johnny Erickson Tata. She's a, a Christian artist and, and an author and a speaker who, who's paralyzed from, from the neck down. On July 30, 1967, she was 18 years old, and she dove into Chesapeake Bay after misjudging the shallowness of the water. She fractured her spine and, and was left paralyzed. During her two years of rehabilitation, she experienced a lot of anger, tremendous amounts of depression, numerous suicidal thoughts, and, and lots and lots of doubts about God and his love and concern for her. In her autobiography, she, she said that during this time in her life, she prayed a prayer that changed everything. She, she prayed, oh God, if I can't die, Show me how to live. And, and Johnny said that was probably the most powerful prayer that I had ever prayed in my entire life. Challenge to you today as, as we leave this place is to simply ask yourself, do I need to pray that prayer? God, show me how to live my life. Maybe we need to to, to, to ask ourselves if we really believed that life in Christ looked like this, and if we really had the discipline to stand together, to be in, of one mind and one spirit and one purpose, if we really had the, the discipline and we really believed that life in Christ lived, look, looked like humility and considering others better than ourselves, if we really believed that, that it looked like looking to the interests of others, if, if it really meant that we had the attitude of Christ, if we had the discipline to, to put energy into our salvation and put hands and feet on this gift of God, if we really believed that life in Christ looked like that, how would we live differently? And let me just ask a real personal question. What kind of difference would living this kind of life make in your marriage? What kind of difference would living this kind of life make in your family, and the relationships that you have with your children, or maybe relationships you have with your parents or, or, or grandparents. What, what kind of difference would living this kind of life make in your neighborhood as you interact with your, your neighbors who may be Christian and maybe non-Christian? What, what kind of difference would, would living this kind of life make as you go to work every day and sit next to people who are either Christian or non-Christian? You know, I'm convinced that if we really believe that this is what life in Christ really looked like, and if we were disciplined to really live it out in our world, it would change everything. It would literally change our world. So the question for me, the question for you, the question for really all of us is, do I really believe this? Do I really believe that this is what life looks like? And am I strong enough, with God's help, to live it out in my life? Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for this morning, and I thank you for your word. I thank you for the opportunity that we have right now to, to just really think about our life. And Father, we know that, that you have made it clear that what life in Christ looks like is, is very different than what we see in the world. It's very different than, than what maybe even some of us have been taught. 
But Father, I pray that you would give us the discipline. You would give us the strength. You would help us through your spirit to walk out of here today changed in maybe little ways and maybe big ways so that we can be your people, so that we can be like Timothy and Epaphroditus and Paul, people who lived out these great principles, that we would be men and women who can stand up in our world and live the principles of Christ. Thank you so much for your grace. Thank you so much for your mercy. And thank you so much for being a God who is always with us. I pray that you would help us as we leave this place today to be your men, to be your women in our world. And Father, we pray this in the great name of Jesus. Amen.